where we present what we've been working on in the team, and anything that we'll work on in the future, and some stuff that we have actually finished. As you might have noticed, if you look at this picture, I am not Torsten. He is unfortunately sick and could not attend the conference, so I jumped in to have this presentation instead. He's the distinguished engineer and team lead of our team, which consists of Alberto, he's in Spain, me, Fabian, who's at the conference, Ignaz, who's also at the conference, Ludwig, who's also at the conference, and Stefan, who's not at the conference, unfortunately. Thorsten has been in SUSE at for a long time and slightly longer active in open source developing. The first topic is Keylime. If you haven't heard of that, it's about remote attestation, where you can, if you have some setup where you do not fully trust some clients where you push workloads to, you can verify that only clients which are currently in a fully trusted state actually have access to your data and can deliver your the results. It works in a fascinating way with measured boot where you collect hashes of every client node that is booting and with some TPM magic, cryptography and everything, the verifier can then verify using even more cryptography magic that this is actually the state that you expect. It had not been tampered with based on the hardware root of trust in the machines inside the TPM. With that, you can have results such as that if the system detects any tampering, like someone locked in per SSH or someone exploited a vulnerability and planted in some binary that is not supposed to be there, this is called immediately, and not only can this be used to basically self-destruct this node, other nodes also immediately revoke this and isolate the other node by, for instance, adding IP tables rules to immediately drop all packets from that location, as that might be malicious and a takeover. What has been done for OpenSUSE and also SLE is that is it is packaged, there is upstream work done, um, and currently, you can install it with system roles, fairly simply, just it's all using the DVD, then you can install the agent for the client system or the verifier that pushes the payloads and manages the clients. It's actually in such a good state that upstream basically treats uh, microS as the reference implementation and distro for Keylam currently. That was already, already true with the previous Python implementation of Keylam, but is also true with the Rust implementation we have now in microS and also the micro 5.4. It's not only available as a package, but meanwhile we also ship them as containers. I'm not sure which of those approaches is currently implemented on the wiki. I think you, we have both possible currently. With Keylime 7.0, we have another feature where in the RPM metadata, we have some more hashes for every file, which we can use that you do not need to have all of the hashes for all possible client combinations, but everything that could possibly be on that node is also from the signed repository metadata that you can get from our download servers. The result is that, at least with Keylime, we are far ahead of any competitors, even if other distros maybe even started earlier, but we really pushed through and have delivered this in a really good state according to upstream. If you have any questions, suggestions, or bug reports, the contact person and the main person who implemented this is Alberto. Next topic is about Yocto. At most embedded conferences, if you talk to people, you get basically one answer. Yeah, your technology seems, seems nice, but we use Yocto. Can we somehow integrate that? And now the answer is yes, you can, basically. For those who don't know, Yocto is a kind of meta build system for embedded distributions. They have one reference distro, which is called Pokey. And it achieves basically that you Git clone something, you run make, and then you get a file system image you can deploy on some hardware. This is used by both hardware vendors, which have their own BSP packages, where they ship a custom kernel, custom user space tools, mostly proprietary, with some ugly hacks on top so that it works on whatever board they sell you. And also from software vendors such as Qt, where they say, yeah, you have your Yocto, we have some layer on top which you can check out and combine with your own Yocto, then you have your software that boots to Qt, for instance. And now we have a way to combine those two approaches and you can actually build 
using Yocto packages you can install on microOS. There is some information on the wiki how you can actually do that. The question is how this gets actually used in practice. Currently, you can only build microOS packages using Yocto. You cannot really build microOS using Yocto. So we'll see how that turns out. Contact person is also, in this case, Alberto. And another Alberto topic, it's microOS and the system upgrade controller used by Rancher. It's basically just one YAML file which allows Rancher to perform updates with transactional update. That works with Slee Micro as well as Micro S. Fuel Ignition is a project where you can, using a web GUI, you can generate the configuration files needed for the initial deployment of Slee Micro and OpenSUSE Micro S. When you deploy those images to either a hard drive or you deploy them in a VM directly, you have them on a USB drive, anything or even onto an SD card in the case of Raspberry Pi or other embedded hardware, you somehow need to configure them so that on the first boot, they know what they're supposed to, that you can log in, that they get the right network configuration, and so on. And to make that easier, we have Fuel Ignition, which is a web app which generates not only the configuration files, but the exact file system image you can then write onto a USB stick or anything else which can be used for configuration. That means you can also use Windows, for instance, where it is otherwise pretty hard to make, for instance, an X4 drive, or even just a file system which is compatible in that case. It also takes care of using the right label and other metadata of the file system so that it can be recognized properly. The new features are that you can now set the host name in the ignition config, you can perform some basic net config work configuration. Not everything, as we all know, network configuration can be really complex, so it's just the basic stuff currently. And in combustion, you can now register your product in the case of Slee Micro by calling basically SUSE Connect inside the script. You can also configure the salt minion so that it registers with the salt master. Contact person for that is Stefan. For transactional update, which is a core part of how Slee Micro and Micro S work in a transactional way, we have a new command. If you don't know transactional update, it basically leverages the support for snapshots we have in the operating system by performing an update inside a snapshot outside of the running system. So we create, basically create a snapshot of the running system, then perform the update, package installation, or basically any change you want outside of the running system, so it's perfectly safe. And if it fails, it can be discarded and just retried again with some fixes. And only if it works, it can be committed and enabled on the next review, for instance. The issue for that is you do need to reboot to make any change you want applicable to the system as in the running system, slash, and most importantly, slash user are read-only. You cannot install packages, you cannot change files in user, you cannot really perform many changes there, which is the design of microOS. With transactional update apply, we have a way to make those changes in the next snapshot effective in the running system in a way that still makes sure that only valid upgrades are applied. So you can run transactional update dup, which creates a new snapshot, runs the upgrade inside, and with transactional update applied, the new snapshot then gets mounted on top of the running system in a not entirely atomic way, but mostly. That means the downside of Libraries which change ABI and then get still loaded by running processes is still there, but at least if the upgrade fails halfway through because you're running out of disk space or some other I.O. or network issues, those cannot happen anymore. It's most useful in a case where you want to install a single new package or maybe even upgrade one library where you know that this is compatible and the system won't crash because it's somehow incompatible with a running process. One counterexample is Firefox. If you change the files that Firefox needs while it is running, the Firefox says, yeah, please restart. So in that case, transactional update will have the same symptoms. Contact persons for that are Ignaz, as the person who implement, implemented most of it, and me, who did the initial proof of concept. Related to this, there is a new feature coming to system the upstream, which they call soft reboot. It is basically right in, right past KXEC. So we have multiple points where we can reboot the system. We can either do a hard reboot and basically shut the entire system down and boot again from firmware, bootloader, kernel, init RD, 
file system, system D, user space, or services. We can also use kexec to skip firmware and bootloader. And now we can also use system D, uh, and, and we could also in the future then use system CTL soft reboot to keep kernel and init RD basically loaded and shut the system down until system D, which then replaces itself, and from there on all services are started again. This can be used to apply uh, those changes in a more efficient way. Another huge topic is systemd boot. One of the goals is that we want systemd boot to be integrated into the system so that in Yast you can then not only select as you previously could, grub, grub2, maybe lilo, you can then select between grub and systemd boot, and ideally it is on the same level of features, so you can still boot into all the snapshots or that stuff. You have health checker where you can then, if the system fails to boot, it automatically performs a rollback, that kind. And it also makes it easier to achieve features such as full disk encryption by moving more responsibilities from the bootloader back into user space. The current issue is that we, put so much, we have to put so much work into Grub to get the system booted for reasons such as the bootloader needs to have access to the files inside each but have a snapshot to load the right kernel in the RD, Grub configuration. If we want to implement stuff like full disk encryption, we then also have to make sure that Grub can decrypt it, like for Lux2, support in Grub only landed recently, support for newer security features like the Argon2, password uh, key derivation function have not even landed upstream yet. And there's also the well-known issue that Grub is extremely slow at actually performing the key derivation. If you have a system with full disk encryption installed, you might have noticed if you enter the password, hit enter, then it takes ages. If the password was wrong, you get put into a Grub rescue shell. If it was right, it still takes ages, and it, at some point it boots. If we move that all into user space again, or respectively the kernel, then this will be much faster, as that is the main point of implementation for all of those. We, knew we would not longer have to do it in bootloader and everything else and make sure that it's always compatible. Another example is X4. Even X4, which is really stable, had some changes lately that meant that after a E2FS tools uh, update, the system did not longer boot because Grub noticed that there was a flag in the super block that it didn't recognize. And that again showed that Grub is really too complex and it really needs changes for everything we do in user space for many new features. System Deboot is also much more active upstream. With Grub, there is the issue that the amount of developers and code is just not in a good ratio. With System Deboot, that's much easier. System Deboot is absolutely tiny. It has only support for what EFI needs, basically. You have a tiny menu you can select with some systemd specific features, which snapshot to boot, what the kernel command line is, which init ID, and it all has to be in the EFI partition. That makes it really small to implement. There's not much to do, and it's pretty predictable, which also helps with full disk encryption if we rely on the TPM boot measurements, where you basically want to know for every boot exactly what happens. With Grub, a lot of stuff happens, including loading of themes, background pictures, which makes it really hard to predict. Other reasons are that uh, the first partners actually ask for systemd boot to be integrated. One reason is also the license, unfortunately, because Grub uses GPLv3, and that is in some cases not really allowed. And one of the uh, goals for implementation at first is to have system deboot integrated into a system to a point that you can install it, but not everything is fully working, but to lower the barrier of entry so that we can get bug reports, feature requests, maybe even submit requests or other fixes submitted. The biggest challenge is the integration with butter snapshots, as the EFI partition is too small to have basically a copy of every kernel and init ID, and there we have to do some tricks like on snapshot creation, make sure that the right kernel and init ID are there, but then garbage collected when a snapshot is deleted, make sure that every combination of kernel, init ID, command line, root file system is available, and also making sure that this is, every, is at all points synchronized, installation works, and all of that. 
One downside is that with systemd boot, we really need EFI to work. It's not supposed to work on any other platform like Legacy x86 or even some embedded hardware where there's no EFI available yet. Other platforms like PowerPC or S390X are also outside of the picture. So doesn't that mean we're going to support drop anywhere? So your question is, doesn't that mean we're going to support drop anywhere? That's something that needs to be discussed. It could also be changed to something else. The, the nice thing about systemd boot is that the way it's configured is specified at systemd upstream. It's called the bootloader specification, very generic name with basically a folder structure and tiny configuration files with pretty much no logic inside. And there's even an implementation for this interface, for the specification in Grub. So if we have support for system boot, we can just use Grub with the support in Grub. And then we don't need this whole Grub specific code anymore. Another so question behind yeah. you? The biggest issue I ha I had with system boot is that requires a, well, a different mm -hmm. layout because you have to copy your um, kernel init RD in the EFI partition. Yes. Because it can only read from the EFI partition. Yes. And our current setup with a 500 meg EFI partition is too small to handle more than, to handle more than one kernel in there. So rollback is impossible. In order, which also means that in order to implement this one properly and to make it possible to even switch between them, you have to change the default layout. Yes. And it would be good if we could do it reasonably quick, as in for ALP. Yes. Because then we would have the chance of even trying to do so. If we're not changing, changing the default layout, you will have to wait for the, very, for the next generation after ALP before you can even try it out, because the layout won't be there. Yes, migration is an open topic. I can imagine that... It's not about migration, it's you have to install the thing. And you can only install if you, well, if you do an install, and that's the thing which you only do very infrequently. And you need support from just for it because you have to have the right partitioning. That part is easy to implement. I think some parts of that are already done. We have the basic construct that just has a system boot option already implemented. I'm not entirely sure about the ESP size. 500 megabytes might be a good size. For installation, no, it's, too it, it's too small. You need more than 500 megs. Because if you want to, you want to copy more than one kernel, more than one integer in it. Because you need it if you ever want to do rollback. How large do you think such an init ID might get? I mean, the gig should be enough. So you're, you would be uh, yeah. required to double the size, but that should be enough. But 500 max definitely is too small. Yeah, that definitely needs to be discussed in detail how we can implement it for the future. And I mean, this whole bootloader specification. This is just a draft which essentially Kai made up at one point. Yes. And so it's, while it's called specification, it's literally just whatever Kai wrote. So um, yeah. has, uh, are there meanwhile any other distributions who switched over to systemd boot? Fedora. They did? They switched over to the bootloader specification with the intention to also offer systemd boot as option. I'm not sure whether they switched to systemd boot yet, but they do have upstream patches for the bootloader specification for Grub. And there is a whole wiki entry. But didn't I also switch to ButterFS, in which case, how are they handling snapshots if, if they support that? I'm not actually sure about that. I think it's two orthogonal things they're working on. They might, not, they might just support ButterFS with snapshots, but not the functionality to actually boot into the snapshots automatically, which requires some a huge drop downstream patches and changes which also is a reason to switch away from a, a system that requires GRUB with a lot of downstream changes to something like uh, the bootloader specification, which makes it more compatible with upstream. Uh, can I ask something? Um, what's the effort to add uh, ButterFS support in the system to boot? Upstream would probably decline that. They, they have a focus on having it in extremely simple and only using file systems provided by EFI are currently the design. There are some links about this topic. Uh, there is a wiki page about how you can use system deboot on your system. There is a devil project where you also can download some images which have system deboot with some snapshot support. 
built in. And there's a to-do list on Redmine where you can follow what is currently missing for full integration. Contact persons for that are Ludwig and me. The last topic is about uh, the future, year 2038, where we know that the world might end or not, at least on 32-bit systems. There are just uh, three things left, at least on 64-bit systems, which we need to fix to make them more future-proof. The easiest one is last lock. It's used, if you even heard of that, it's not really popular. If you enter the, uh, if you view the last lock records, it basically shows you which user was locked in, uh, when a user was locked in the last time. So basically for each user ID on the system, you get a date, a TTY, and that's it. The issue is this file is in var log last log and it has a fixed format and it has that for decades. It uses the same format in 64-bit and 32-bit systems, so it uses a 32-bit time t timestamp, which means that it overflows in a couple of years and we need to somehow fix that. The good news is there is no API. Well, the good and bad news is there is no API to access this file. Every application basically has the had a definition of how this looks like internally and then does the reading and writing itself. So what, what uh, we did here is we invented last log2, which switches out this file with the fixed structure with an SQLite database with one record per user. This is written to by a PAM module on every login and you can read that out with the last log2 command. This command is from the API compatible with the old command. So unless you try to write the varlog last log file yourself, or, or uh, it is, should be pretty much a drop in replacement. It's already the default in OpenSUSE Tumbleweed and MicroS if you install the system now and if you upgrade it in the last few months. Not quite as easy is the WTMP file. This is a history of user logins and system starts. Start in varlog WTMP. It is not rotated, it's just there forever. The same issue appears here because of the possibility that you run 32-bit applications on a 64-bit system, system. It has the usual 32-bit time t timestamp in the file. There is a public API available to read and write this file, but it doesn't allow to report errors and it's not easy to extend because then you also end up with glibc ABI issues. So, Question is what to do there. The data is fortunately mainly read by last, and applications don't really seem to write it properly anyway, so it appears like there aren't many users left. GDM, for instance, integrates, uh, creates two entries for each login, and LightDM has some dummy data in it, probably because of some internal LightDM design, and they just add some entry into the API to write any entry. The solution for that is WTMPDB, which also uses SQLite to store the data and uses another PAM module to write this. There is a library available for applications which need to read and write it directly, basically as replacement for the API that was there previously. UTMP is similar to WTMP. It has the history of logins of the current boot. It is stored in a volatile location in Varan UTEM. So after every reboot, the file is deleted. There, the format is exactly the same, and it's also not fully seen and registered basically which applications read and write this file. It's mainly used to count which user is currently logged in by basically replaying the log and seeing this user logged in, then it logged out again, then someone logged in, and then listing which users are currently active on which TTY. The solution for that is basically using systemd login D. It already knows which users are logged in at which TTY and we just need to make it compatible with all the display managers, make sure that it, they fill in all the data currently, which some of the display managers didn't. And one issue is that SSH still does not write the correct TTY in the first uh, call to the PAM module stack. And to fix that, there was some new API needed for systemd to, after the SSH login, set the TTY correctly. Upstream pro projects accepted this. Uh, 
proof of concept patches for core utils exist if someone has contact with upstream developers to get them merged, that would be welcome if you could reach out to Torsten. Documentation for those uh, three topics is available on Torsten's blog and GitHub. He's also the main context person for that. Other topics, are we have a web page with all of the man pages from Tumbleweed available. Those are generated by a containerized docserve executable, which basically scans the entire repository and then generates man pages for everything in HTML format. This is then pushed to a public-facing web server. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? <laughs>